heard. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord. seats just for a moment. What a week it has been. In our small groups, our triads, we ask each other, how goes it with your soul this week? Uh, I would have to say, even though it's a negative confession, uh, I would quote Thomas Paine, who was an agnostic but wrote Common Sense, sparked the American Revolution. These are the times that try men's souls, and as we watched the images emerging from Afghanistan, it was devastating. This has global uh, effects. It's not good, but we also know that God causes all things to work together for good for them that love God, who are the called according to His purpose. He is the sovereign all of all, over all. He moves in history, and so we're going to begin this morning by praying for Afghanistan. Would you join me, please? Father, we're coming before you in the name of Jesus. We're coming by way of the priceless, precious blood of Jesus that is able to scour our hearts clean from an evil conscience so that we might come before you with open faces, expectant faces. We could come boldly before your throne of grace that we might receive grace to help in the time of need. And Father, we are coming that you would help us worship you as we ought. But Lord, we're also coming in a form of intercession, and we are praying, Lord, for the country of Afghanistan. First and foremost, Lord, we are praying for the Christians that are there. We're already aware of some martyrdoms. We are aware of workers that are working there. I think of uh, Robbie Dawkins working there, it just was there in January. And Lord, uh, there are believers that want to see their family get out, but they are asking not for safety for themselves. They're praying for boldness, that they can go back and confront their own. They love their fellow countrymen. They love the Taliban. They'd like to see them converted. And so, oh God, we're praying that you would unleash the dreams and visions with which you've touched so many other uh, Muslims just over the past 30 years, God. Oh Lord, would you do it with them? Would you use this 
this hell hole to be turned around and be a trophy of your grace and glory. God, you're able to do it. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Lord, we're, we're sad over every drop of blood that is shed, innocent blood. But Lord, may that redound to the growth of your church. Oh God, oh God. And Lord, we pray for uh, all the efforts that are being done, as much rescue that can be done, all of that, Father. We just sometimes don't know what to pray or how we ought to pray, but we're trusting that the Spirit of the living God is making intercession for us. We do this corporately this morning, and Lord, we'll be careful to continue to pray for these needs as time goes on. In Jesus' name, yes. amen and amen. And now I'm going to invite Ted Muir to give us the morning reading. Well, I've had a rather thorny last few months, and as a result, the Lord led me to this scripture for today, and I pray that it might meet some of your needs as well as having met mine. Um, it's 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 10. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Yay, Lord. Praise you, Lord. And, and yesterday's um, devotion just uh, struck it right where it belongs and it says I am a God this is God again speaking I am a God who heals I heal broken bodies broken minds broken hearts broken lives and broken relationships my very presence has immense healing powers you cannot live close to me without experiencing some degree of healing however it is also true that you have not you have not because you ask not you receive the healing that flows naturally from my presence, whether you seek it or not. But there is more, much more, available to those who ask. The first step in receiving healing is to live ever so close to me. The benefits of this practice are too numerous to list. As you grow more and more intimate with me, I reveal my will to you more directly. When the time is right, I prompt you to ask for healing of some brokenness in you or in another person. The healing may be instantaneous, or it may be a process. That is up to me. Your part is to trust me fully and to thank me for the restoration that has begun. I rarely heal all the brokenness in a person's life. Even my servant Paul was told, my grace is sufficient for you when he sought healing for the thorn in his flesh. Nonetheless, much healing is available to those whose lives are intimately interwoven with mine. Ask and you will receive. Hallelujah. Amen. You, Let's stand and worship the Lord. When I see the
saints and angels, they bow before your crowns before the Lamb of God and sin. Let's sing that again. All the saints and angels
the voices now. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve. together in unison. Glory, 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 glory to the Lamb of Certainly, He does deserve it all. We are just so mightily blessed. You know, Steve alluded to in his opening all the chaos, chaos that's going on in the world, and here we are, free and safe to worship our God. We're so blessed. And as we're counting... I'm sorry, Mark. I'm sorry. Did his microphone just cut out? Yeah. All right. Uh, Mark, uh, just come up here, please. Just come up to Janie's mic, please. So for our, our friend and brother, David, in, in Chicago, I just want to pray for him. So our Father and our God, how great are you? How great are you, Lord God, over all the earth that we in this church right here in Aurora, Ohio can pray for a brother 300 miles away and be confident and know that you are answering that prayer. You are the God that heals, Jehovah Rapha. And Lord God, we pray for that healing for David's heart we pray, Lord God, that you would disintegrate every one of those blood clots and, and send them into the oblivion they came from. Lord, Lord God, give his family comfort and hope and peace in their hearts today as they anxiously await the homecoming of their dad. Out of the hospital, back at home, and loving them like a dad's supposed to. That's your will, Lord God. That's your purpose in his life, not the chaos of disease in our body. So in Jesus' name, we pray that over David and know that it will be done. Amen. So the, the second thing, I had a little testimony I wanted to share this morning. And I've, I've talked to Steve and some of the guys about this this week. But I hope for everybody this is the same Thing. Just, I, I hope you, you all have the, the experience in the sense that the Spirit of God is really moving in us. I would say most certainly for the last two or three months, you could really feel it. And certainly for the last month, I'll say, um, 
since Steve's friend from Germany was here and he talked about dancing in the fog. That sort of started the whole roiling of the Holy Spirit, I think, really getting revved up. And, and so often we feel like that, don't we? That, that we're in a fog and, and we're kind of afraid to dance in it. And then Steve followed that up with messages of uh, the, scent, the scent of water. And in the word, behold, and in delighting the Lord. And, and you all know, most of you know, I work in Pittsburgh three days a week. So when I go there, whether it's a Monday or this week, it'll be a Tuesday. I leave pretty early. I, I try to get to the office by 5.30. So I'm leaving here around 3.30, 4 o'clock. And this week, I prayed all the way there. I just prayed that what we've been hearing preached to us would come to life, that I could see that. I got to Pittsburgh, and uh, our office is right at the University of Pittsburgh, and there's a lot of homeless people there. And I, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but homeless people, there's kind of two kinds. There's a kind who are actually destitute and need help, and there's a kind that's organized and sent out to beg for money in different spots of the city at certain parts of the day, and you kind of wonder about that. And that's what you see a lot of there on the street. So I go up to the office, everything, it's still dark outside, everything's pitch black inside. <laughs> and there's a guy laying on the stoop and he's actually blocking the door, he can't get in the door. <laughs> so he's a big guy. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, okay, what do I do? Uh, so I kind of walked up to him, I'm like, hey buddy. <laughs> and fortunately he didn't jump up wanting to box me, but <clears throat> he kind of woke up with a start. I said, could, could you let me get in the door here? Oh, yeah, yeah. So he, he moved his feet and I got indoor. Now, I got inside, and I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit overwhelmed me. I literally couldn't take two steps in the office. I had to sit down. And I, I knew God wanted me to do something, and so many things are running through my head. Of course, the, the, the Good Samaritan story is running through my head. And, uh, you know, what do I do? Do I go that far? But the point is, you got to do something, Right? So I said, well, at the very least, I can offer him a cup of coffee. We have a coffee maker in there. And so I go back out, open the door, say, hey, uh, would you like a cup of coffee? He goes, oh, yeah, man, that'd be great. It's okay. So then order, you got to get, get all the details, right? You want cream and sugar in it. You know how I have stuff. But. So, so I got him a cup of coffee the way he wanted it. And I took it out to him, and, and, uh, and I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk to him. I was just going to hand him a cup of coffee. So... He says, my name's Mark. What's yours? He says, Trey. I said, oh, Trey. I says, uh, what, you know, what brings you here? He says, oh, he says, uh, I was in the hospital. I said, you were in the hospital? He goes, yeah. He said, I had chest pains last night. I went into the ER, and they did, I think they took care of me, and they, and they sent me out, but I can't catch a bus this time in the morning. I said, oh, okay. So I told him, I said, I told him two things. I said, look, I'm here every morning. Well, three days a week, I'm here at this time in the morning. If you ever see me here, you can always get a cup of coffee. I said, but the other thing is, I want to pray for you. And he was very receptive to that. And so I prayed with him, you know, for God to heal his heart. There wasn't a salvation message in it, but I just wanted to know that at least one other human being actually cared enough to try to help him and pray for him. And I praise God for that. Because that's the Holy Spirit of God looking out for one of his children. Take the well, we've had more technical difficulties. We've had more technical difficulties this morning than the past six months combined. And everything was working until it wasn't working. But let's not be intimidated. This microphone works, and you can come up and share what God has given you to share, please. Good morning, everybody. My church family, I love you guys. I'm blessed. I still hurt. But it just kept coming to me with the incense arise. What came to me with the incense arise was praise him 
in that storm, dance in that storm. What came to me with the instance of rise is praise him, worship, give him glory, give him honor. I don't care what you're going through because he's going to be there for you. Mm, it's going to be a rough one, but guess what? That's the blessing. And I just want to encourage each and every one of you guys. I miss my daughter so much. It comes and goes, and I keep blocking it out, but I just keep on going because I guess what? I know one day I'm going to see her. I'm going to see her. It's devastating. But at the end of the day, I can still praise and worship my God because he gave me strength to get through all of this for over a year. Somebody that you took care of for 39 years. I just want to let you guys know God is still on the throne. And you're going to go through some things in your life. Don't give up. Lift your head up to the sky. Praise him. Worship him. That's the incense. The incense that arise. Because without God, we cannot do anything. Don't let the devil fool you. Stand on his word. Worship him. I don't care how bad it is. If you got to play a song to him, make your own song up if you ain't got it. Because he's going to be there with you. Just please, everybody, just listen to me. Because God is there for all of us. We can't look down on nobody. If they're acting a little different, pray for them. Keep going. The incense must arise to him. sharing with the uh, guys um, Saturday morning uh, as far as what the Lord was speaking to me personally and uh, and I gave him I said that it, what he was speaking to me uh, was he gave me the word extend and uh, uh, I had the I had the picture of uh, um, in, in football they a quarterback will sometimes throw the ball and he'll throw the ball in such a way um, that only his receiver can get it. But the receiver has to extend to get it, has to reach for it. And, uh, and so it um, takes a little certain competitive fire to, to play like that. And uh, I felt uh, I had a, um, and it, it's neat how God is, opening new circumstances in my life that's making me extend myself. Some of them as simple as wel welcoming a new dog in my family. Um, and, I've and I've never been a person to be a huge pet owner. So that is an extend to me. And it may sound small or whatever, but learning to, to what that all is going to mean. And, um, and also this Tuesday, I'm going to be speaking in front of my a fellow faculty and I'm leading the meeting and I'm really extending myself before the Lord asking him what do you want me to say to them you have a, a purpose for them being faculty for being there and I can share that with them and I'm asking him to help me do that and that's a, and I'm having to manage my emotions in there uh, but I got this image as I was just thinking about this that the, the Lord gave me. I got the image of a butterfly. And uh, it starts out as a caterpillar, right? And then it builds a cocoon around itself. I, I kind of got a fast image of it doing all of that, building the cocoon around itself. And then it has to fight its way out of the cocoon that it's in to be what it's called to be. And so I, I, I had that image and I had, and I thought of, about us and what God is doing in us and um, just being sort of um, cocooned, if you will, in his Holy Spirit and inspiring us. And, and Steve and I are, are, are honestly before you, we're, we're praying and we're extending ourselves, believing God to do amazing things in all of your lives. And we're hearing <laughs> some things that are getting us a little excited but I just felt like we're in a time where 
Uh, God is going to press us out, make us press out like that butterfly has to fight its way out of the cocoon to be what it's supposed to be, to extend its wings and do what it's supposed to do because we have a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all we could ask or imagine and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. So there's been just a few things about um, what seems to have happened in the service today that is really striking me because of uh, what had happened for me actually yesterday. Um, the first, is just there seems to be kind of a few things in terms of like healing and um, the power of God to be able to do that you know, in the church and in our lives today. Thank you, Lord. Um, but so I was at a Randy Clark conference. He's, you know, he moves in the ministry of healing. And um, I was reading one of his books and he's kind of going through the same thing that uh, was brought up earlier about um, Paul and the thing about the thorn in the flesh. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's interesting. That's kind of happening again. And then again, you know, the prayer for healing for uh, Mr. Rasmussen and so I was singing, I was like, oh, wow, even that's kind of curious. And then our song that's like, you know, you're worthy of all of it was taking me back to this moment during the conference where I really felt like the Lord had asked me to lay out um, all of the different kind of uh, accessories or effects that I had on my person during that time of prayer. And I felt like each one actually like represented something that I wasn't just like surrendering to the Lord because it was like, you know, oh, you know, um, you know, that's what you do. But it was like, it was some kind of a recognition in that moment that was like, no, actually, all of this is already yours. And I am, you've allowed me to be a steward of it. And um, I don't want to dare to presume to think of it as mine that I could just do whatever without being led by you in regard to it. And some of the things that I laid out um, were <laughs> my sunglasses, my watch, my wallet, my passport, my shoes, and then like my hoodie. And I felt like each one kind of represented something that I was saying like this is this is the Lord's the gift from the Lord to me and so of course like the wallet is my finances you know how I spend my money and my watch my time you know what do I do with my time oh my phone as well uh, my phone is like who, who do I talk to who am I connecting with intentionally or otherwise um, my sandals were like where am I where am I standing where am I going you know where's the Lord placing me um, my glasses was like, um, what is the image that I'm giving off? Like, who, who do I see myself as? Who do others see me as? And then my hoodie was like my comfort. It was like, you know, my desire to be comfortable. <laughs> and just like, I really was sensing that as we were singing that song, like maybe I'm supposed to share that today and just kind of remind us all that it, it is all his. It's, none of it is ours. And, and just like really choosing to be of that mindset of saying, Lord, I want to consult you. I want to seek your face in regard to these things. Lord Jesus, all of our things that you have given us, they are gifts of stewardship. Lord, may we honor you with them. Lord, may we not presume to use them for our own ends and our own gratification, but Lord, may we instead honor you and bless those around us with them. And the last thing was just, uh, I don't know, just again, because of the healing conferencing and all of that, um, 
I, you know, when I ask you maybe later after the service or something, if we can just kind of enter a time of healing prayer or something like that, um, and if people would be willing to be participants with me in praying for that, as well as the people who want to be healed in that way. I had actually gotten up before to say something, and then the Lord said, no, just wait, wait. I came down. I wasn't going to say anything. But I feel so prompted by the Holy Spirit to just talk a moment about glory. Because it's something that is not quite understood, I think, by a whole lot of us. It's something that we are weary about, you know, touch not the glory kind of deal. And yet what I was hearing, especially from what Ben was saying, is that we are to steward God's glory. It is in our glory, it's His glory. But we are to steward that glory. How does God receive glory? God receives glory when Jesus is reflected in the church. So our lives, our actions, our laying down our things gives Him glory. We become, to those who see us, His image. And that's what glorifies Him. So we are not to fear the glory. We are to steward the glory. We are to embrace the glory. It's not ours. It's His. But we are partakers in it. As we are partakers in everything that God does with us. I was teaching... Uh, just yesterday morning on grace the word says that we are saved because of God's grace through our faith correct if it were just God's grace everybody would be saved because the word says that his desire is that none should perish and yet the word says that narrow is the path that leads to him and wide is the road to hell few find the path to him even though God's grace is available to everybody so what's the missing ingredient the missing ingredient is faith we are saved by his grace through our faith we play a role in it and it's in that sense that I'm talking about understanding that we steward God's glory that we play a role in keeping his glory, if you will, manifested through our lives before those that look at us. And I want to tell you, we have a whole lot of people looking at us that we may not even realize are looking at us. And I don't just mean family and friends and all that. You know, we are meant to be light. We are meant to be visible. We are meant to be up front when needed. We are meant to be real. We're meant to be true. Because if we don't have the truth, then who does? I have a word I want to pray. One word I want to pray for Brother David Rasmussen from the Word of God. Because the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And the word I want to pray into David Rasmussen right now is that God is the strength of his heart and his portion forever. In Jesus' name, we send forth that word because your word says he sent forth his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. In Jesus' mighty name, to God be the glory. For most of Gateway Church's history, we had bulletins on Sunday morning and it had the title of the message on it. We're not doing that currently. So the various speakers today did not know what I was going to share about. But I'd like to talk to you briefly about 
glory in the church. This, of course, is taken from a phrase, unto him be glory in the church. This is the benediction I give every Sunday, and Derek quoted the first part of it, Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to that power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church through Jesus Christ and all generations. In a moment, I'll tell you why I'm speaking about this, but first, just so we're all on the same page, when we talk about glory in the church, and Franco was giving a little bit of what does glory mean, we're just going to touch a little bit more on this. Nothing really new here, but very quickly, the Hebrew word kabod, properly, weight, figuratively, copiousness, splendor, honor, glory. This is often spoken of just human beings. He was a man of honor, man of weight, weighty, gravitas. We have one of Eli's daughter-in-laws giving birth when the Ark of the Covenant had been taken by the Philistines, the glory of God, and so she named him Ichabod, no glory, the glory has departed. So there you see the word right there in the name Ichabod. And then the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology tells us this word glory, kabod, lends itself to the idea that one, the one possessing glory is laden with riches, power, position, etc., and the New Testament picks up this idea of heaviness. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So there's a contrasting with light versus heavy, weighty glory, and it's momentary versus eternal. Now, God is the God of glory. We're told that in Acts 7, 2. God is called the God of glory. In Ephesians 1.17, he's called the Father of glory. So in and of himself, he doesn't merely have glory. He is glory. He is the defining one of glory. God has inherent majesty. Inherent means it's in him, in and of himself. His attributes are weighty. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present, unchanging, all-holy, and all-loving. I picked up a hitchhiker in 1977. And I remember this because the miniseries Jesus of Nazareth, director Franco Zeffirelli, had just come on network TV. And I was watching it. I had just become a Christian the year before. And so I picked up a hitchhiker and driving along. I said, have you seen Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, yeah, I did. What'd you think? Heavy duty. It's 1977. So you're kind of hippie, heavy, heavy duty. God is heavy duty. This guy didn't know God from Adam's house cat. But somehow watching just a little bit of Jesus of Nazareth, he recognized there was something weighty about it. And then if we pick up, that was the Old Testament, we pick up from the New Testament, the Greek doxa, to be very apparent, to be manifest, glory. And so, for example, Luke 2, 9, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. So, as we combine these two ideas of to be weighty and to be manifest, we find that the glory of God is the manifestation of God's being, power, and character. It is in his very nature to have these attributes shine forth. So God is heavy-duty, he's weighty, and in and of himself he has gravitas, he's the most, gravitas, most heavy-duty person in the universe, and yet this doesn't just remain, he's not a black hole, it, he can't, it just it radiates out. It's just of the very nature of who he is. Now it's interesting that gold in the Bible is used as a symbol of God's glory, and that's because weight Gold is very dense. It's, it's weighty. It also shines. So there you got the two attributes, the, the kabod and the doxa. It's weighty. It shines. And in addition, purity. Uh, gold of all the metals, you can get probably the most refined. And so it speaks of purity. Also speaks of durability or incorruptibility. It doesn't combine with anything. It doesn't combine with acids or alkaline, doesn't oxidize, doesn't rust. So it has all of that about it. And you kind of get the idea that God is incorruptible without sin. And then 
it's most highly valued. I mean, the gold standard. And this has been true for a long, long time. And now I take you on a brief two-minute excursus on money, the most tradable commodity. Here's some necessary characteristics of money, five of them. Divisibility, durability, transportability, recognizability, and scarcity in relation to demands. So I raise cows and Ben makes sandals for the feet. Uh, I would like a pair of sandals. I don't want to give you a whole cow. I'll give you a half a cow. It's not very easily divisible. So you could be crudely trading, but people soon found that how, we need something that is easily dividable, and yet it won't. I know we could, people appreciate cold drinks in the summer. We could trade in ice cubes. It doesn't have the durability that melts. So historically, many objects were used as money. Cattle, from which we get live stock, you know, stocks. Well, here's some live stock. Shell, shell out. Salt, solarium, Latin, salary. Tobacco leaves, precious stones. But again, precious stones, I got this diamond and I have a loaf of bread. You don't want to divide the diamond. So historically, just if I could say it, do I dare say it? the free marketplace of people exchanging. They, they, humans, just found metals work the best. And of all those metals, guess which one takes pride of place? It's gold. It's always been that way. Gold, silver, to the, I mean, whether it's Nebuchadnezzar's image of a head of gold, and then silver, and then brass, it starts with gold to this day. What's the first place in the Olympics? What kind of metal do you get? Second place is Silver's good, but gold's better. It's always been that way. And then we find in the Bible, the tabernacle has gold all over the place. The temple really has the gold all over the place under Solomon. And so it's just a picture of God's glory. And again, we have Proverbs and other places. You know, your law, your commandments are more precious to me than gold. Your wisdom is more precious than gold. And again, gold is scarce. You've got to mine it out of the earth and all that. So it's a good picture type of glory. Now, I've shared all of this to bring you to this Bible verse, this Bible passage, which in my reading I came across about six days ago, and it really struck me and then I read something later that confirmed, oh, okay, I need to talk about this. So 1 Kings 14, 25 through 28, I've read of Saul. He failed the Lord in obedience, but then David, a man after God's own heart, and he puts all of Israel's enemies to flight, and so there can be peace in the days of his son Solomon, and God blesses Solomon beyond all imagination, just gold. They didn't count silver in those days. It was this gravel. It was a, Queen of Sheba comes from the end of the earth to see his glory, the weightiness of Solomon, both in his wisdom, the grandeur of his palace, the temple, all of this. And it's all thrown away. Kingdoms divided. A guy named Jeroboam takes the ten northern tribes and has what's called now Israel. Rehoboam takes southern Judah and Simeon is kind of amalgamated within Judah. And so Judah is the southern kingdom. And so Rehoboam is reigning over this little area. I'll tell you what, the enemies of God, when stuff happens, Putin, Xi of China, Khomeini of Iran, they start looking. And so it is with, back then, Shishak of Egypt. Oh, having some trouble up there? So it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields which Solomon had made. Now again, he took away everything. And think about that. The temple, all sorts of gold things he's taking away. It's just painful. But it highlights the shields, which I had read about in 1 Kings 8 earlier. 1 Kings 10. Oh, highlights those shields. So you always kind of look at those kind of things. Took away everything, all the gold, but he, and these gold shields. What's, what's up with that? Well, then it goes on and says, Then King Rehoboam made 
bronze shields in their place. And that just, oh, okay. Bronze, years ago you used to have a brass bed. It quickly oxidized, but if you really polish it, it'll kind of sheen. So you can have bronze shields, and if you shine them up, it can look kind of shiny, but it ain't gold. What's, what's bronze in the Olympics? It's third, isn't it? Nebuchadnezzar, gold, silver, torsos, bronze. That's it. But it, it looks like the gold, but it ain't gold. And watch this. And committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. And whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, the guards carried them, then brought them back into the guardroom. So this is sort of a processional kind of a show, a dignitary of state. And when he comes in, the guards bring out the shields. But it's not the same. It's not the glory of gold. But you're making a, a posture, a pretense that it's the same, but it's not. And I'm afraid that throughout church history we can find times and seasons, and we have been in one of those in late America where the church has exchanged the glory of God, the glory in the church for bronze. It shines, it looks good. We have some of the most polished speakers. And seriously, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, and I'm saying that because, because of the availability of seminars, seminaries, online things. People, I mean, when I was first learning, I was listening to every preacher I could get a hold of, and some people were afraid that when I began speaking, I'd speak with a British accent because one of my favorite teachers was Derek Prince. <laughs> Tonight we are speaking on deliverance and demonology. And they say that, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of uh, flattery. And uh, so, <laughs> so preachers are at their best as far as telling you what the Bible says. The worship helps. It's not old Miss McGillicuddy and we're still putting up with her, but banging out a tune on the out of tune piano. And as she gets older, her fingers don't quite move as quickly. And we kind of, no, no, no. We have cutting edge. And if you're a small church, they have multi worship tracks you can play. I, I mean, so technically, unless you're having all the glitches we had this morning, technically, worship as far as that goes, and the, but my dear, dear friends, and I'm speaking to Steve Neptune as well, Gateway Church, the glory has departed, compared to what God intends. And I can already tell my PowerPoint's a little bit screwed up here, but let's see if I can advance this. Uh, yeah, Exodus 40, 34 and 35, it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This is when the tabernacle was completed and the glory of God fills it. Now, I have to be careful how I say this. It, I mean, the glory of God is intrinsic to God, but it's not necessarily his person. It's hard to kind of describe this. And, and when Moses was up on the mount where the glory was on top of Sinai, he went up into the cloud and he actually picked up some of the glory and it shone on his face. But that's not pieces of God on his face. So, so there's something about the glory that this thing radiates. God is so powerful it radiates out and, and can have effect in an area so much, it's so heavy, again, weight, kabod, heavy, you couldn't even stand a minister. And the same thing happened at the dedication of the temple, 1 Kings 8, 10, and 11. It came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And the Bible says whose house we are, speaking of New Testament times, we are a temple being built by living stones. God wants there to be what in the church? What are we talking about this morning? What's the top? Glory in the church. It's spelled G-L-O-R-Y in English. It is not spelled B-R-O-N-Z-E. 
not bronze, not brass. It's gold. We're looking for the gold. We're looking for the glory. We're looking for the glory in the church. And you know something? Psalm 63.2 says, David said, so I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. You know something? When people come to church, it's not wrong for them to expect something of God, not just a really, really good show, not just at a horizontal level, we have the best donuts in town, come to the Easter egg hunt, but there's something here you can't get anywhere else. I've been reading God's Glory by Todd Smith. This is the pastor that's been stewarding, you mentioned stewarding, stewarding the North Georgia Revival, which kicked off in February of 2018 and continues. <clears throat> Wonderful story, but there's one in particular that arrested me. He was invited to speak at a small church in East Texas. He was there the glory of God came. They saw people saved. They saw healings. There was a local sheriff and the warden of the local state prison who were friends, Christians. They came. They saw this. They actually arranged to bring some prisoners back the next time Todd was there. He was there a month later. And they offered the prisoners pizza to come. In. Well, there was one man there named Robert real tall, maybe 6'5", 275, skinhead, leader of the Aryan nation, hated Jews, hated blacks, everything else. He runs the Aryan brothers in the prison, and I don't know how this works, but also controls the Aryan brothers. He's the head of them in four other prisons. Don't ask me how that works, but this is who this guy was. Multiple murders. He testified to Pastor Todd later. He just enjoyed watching the life drain out of someone. But Robert experienced something that night that electrified him. And when it came time for the baptisms, he came forward, stood, and then he came up to the water. As soon as he touched his toe in the water, he spread out his hands like this. And with tears running down his face said, I always wanted something like this. Not donuts, not nice music, not an Easter egg hunt, not a free family fun fest. We've tried all those things, but we need something much more than that to reach Robert, who's stone cold dead in his heart. He needs God, and more, he needs the God of glory. And he says, I've always wanted something like this. We were in no hurry. We let him take his time. There was no need to rush the moment as God was working on him. God's arm was reaching out to him from the midst of the water, inviting Robert to take hold of his hand. The bystanders were mesmerized as before he was immersed, this robust man with both feet firmly planted placed both his hands over his face and wept like a baby. God was melting big Robert right before our eyes. God's overwhelming love, conviction, and power settled on him. We watched heaven and all of its glory come upon a very wicked man. It took two grown men to help submerge him to be baptized. Honestly, I didn't think the tank would hold him. It almost didn't. Two inches of water splashed over the edge of the tank onto the sanctuary floor when he was fully immersed. While underwater, the Lord met Robert with a ferociousness. That was completely unexpected. I have witnessed thousands of baptisms. I will never forget this one. Robert had a supernatural encounter with Jesus that rocked him to the core. When Robert came up for air, he immediately placed his hands on his face and again began to cry. And we heard him whisper, precious, 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 precious. In between sobbing, I asked Robert, why was he saying precious? He replied, when I was in the water, I saw Jesus' face. And it was precious.
There was an immediate transformation right there in that tank. Jesus met Robert and he became a new man. God took a violent, hate-filled man in one moment in the water, delivered him from all the anger, hatred, and drugs that ruled his life. Robert's conversion was so authentic and life-changing that he quickly was looked upon by the other inmates as the spiritual leader and pastor. The most remarkable part of the story is that he became best friends with Melroy. Melroy is an African-American man and the two of them together pastor the jail. They love each other as if flesh and blood brothers. Only God can take a violent area nation's gang member and touch his heart so deeply that he no longer hates anyone. Now he loves other one. Oh, and everyone. And oh, for the record, the prisoners no longer call him Robert. They call him Precious. <laughs> Can I invite the worship team to come? Worship team to come. Dear ones, I've got to have the glory of God in the church. I don't want physical gold. I don't want anything else. And look, well, he's just one of these kooky, charismatic Pentecostals chasing after miracles and signs. And what? No, I want that kind of miracle. Total, total transformation by the power of the risen Christ hitting someone. And if they can reach Robert, they can reach anyone. And I am demanding of myself what the message that Ben gave, just inventory. It is all yours, God. Let every last drop of it. And I will not cease to pray fast and lay it all out until I see the Roberts converted. Let's stand. So Ben, please go to the back. Anybody that needs healing, Tabitha, you go back there with him. If you need some healing, go back there and let's receive a little bit of the glory. For the rest of us, we're going to sing this song. This is our prayer. This is our hymn of dedication. Father of creation, unfold your sovereign plan. Raise up the chosen generation that will march to the land.
Let your kingdom come. Let your glory in the church arise, O oh God. And now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think, according to that power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church through Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Praise the Lord. We are free to go with the grace of God.